Hi everyone. Um, we're back again and we have got an amazing guest tonight. I'm so excited, so excited to hear her story. Um, there we go. We'll send. Okay, I hope you're all well. Hi Alistair, nice to see you or someone from Alistair Little. That's great. Um, I hope you've all ordered some delicious food because they really do make some great food that they cook to order and then deliver. Um, I think today you order for Saturday and then Saturday you order for Wednesday, something like that. Um, but we had the pleasure of talking to Alistair, so that was great. Um, and tonight we've got um, Olya Herkules, who is the Ukrainian um, food writer um, who's done two award-winning books and then she has a new book coming out um, next month. So that's very, very exciting. And she's also just become a mummy for the second time. So I love that. That's very nice. Um, but we're going to talk all about her food, um, which I think is delicious. I know it's delicious, but I can't say I'm an expert on it. So it'll be great to hear from her um, as to what she um, can share with us. She's had a very interesting backstory. And that's what I'm really, really loving about lots of these people. Um, some people just become chefs straight away and that's fine. And other people, they have a different life before they become a chef. Um, so that's great. So I hope you're enjoying these um, kitchen conversations. Um, I think this week, it's not the last, don't worry, but we're not going to do them at the weekends because please, can I have some time off? Um, so we'll change them to Monday to Friday. We've got some great people next week, so stay tuned. Um, I'm just going to send Olia another message. OK, I think she's most probably just tied up at the moment, um, but she'll join us so you can have me rabbiting on for a little bit. Um, so we're going to not do um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, which will be great um, for me. <laughs> I hope you won't miss us too much. And then um, we'll run the Monday to Friday. And um, because so far to date, we've done them non-stop except for every day. And we've had some fantastic people. Hi, Olia, I can see you there. Brilliant. I am just so looking forward to meeting you. Um, so... Yeah, that will be great. Um, but thank you for joining in, everyone. But we'll still be here. Hello, Olia. Hi. How Hello. are you? Very nice to meet you. And thanks for joining us very much. Lovely to meet you, too. You look absolutely fantastic for someone who's just had her second child, <laughs> I have to say. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great news. So can I just introduce Olia Hercules, who um, has written two award-winning books, Mamushka, and the other one, Kam Kamkasis? Caucasus, yeah. Thank you. And um, she has a new one, which we're going to talk about in detail in a minute. But can we just talk about your journey into food? Because I think that's very exciting. It's very uh, interesting. So you grew up in the Ukraine and then at the age of 12, went across to Cyprus with your family. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we went to Cyprus. I went into an English school there. You know, I spoke no English. Um, and kind of, yeah, that was quite intense. Uh, so, you know, loads of kind of like phases in my life where I had to adapt to different situations in a way. So, yeah, so I did, we did that for five years. I kind of, you know, my formative years happened in Cyprus. And then when it came to um, the time to go to university after my A-levels, um, I just thought I'll go somewhere that's quite close to home so I can go back and see my parents because I was thinking maybe America or something, but then I thought, no. So it's going to be the UK. And then I went to work university and, um, and then right. I did a degree in London. And then, yeah. And in between your degree and your master's, did you go off to Italy? Because you grew yeah. up in a family of um, growers and cooks, but you weren't particularly into cooking, were you? <laughs> no, I wasn't at all, actually. <laughs> uh, very lazy. I love to eat, uh, but cooking wasn't really on my radar when I was a teenager. So my dad kind of um, made me, well, he insisted that I cook with my mom every weekend because my mom is such an amazing cook. And I think to him, it was unfathomable that I wouldn't actually, that I wouldn't know the pleasure of doing it. So he was like, no, like, just try it. You're going to like it. I didn't like it. I burnt everything. I was terrible. 
Um, but then just before I went to university, uh, me and my mom sat down and I still have it somewhere. We made this little notebook where she, um, you, you know, where we wrote down some simple recipes that I could kind of make at university. And then I went and I tried making a few things, um, but we only had, it was on campus at Warwick University. So we had this um, one little supermarket. And I mean, let's be honest, the ingredients weren't what they are in Ukraine and Ukrainian food is pretty much about this great produce like there's no spicing you know there's very little spicing to hide behind so it's just um, amazing techniques and really interesting and sometimes quite complex but you do you do need the good ingredients so yeah it didn't work out I kind of made it and I was like oh this tastes awful <laughs> and I was there and I was like hmm and then kind of stopped for a bit. And then I went to Italy, as you say, um, uh, on a year abroad, because I studied Italian at university, Italian and international relations. And I went to Italy and I was just amazed at um, how young people, how well they cooked. Mm -hmm. So everybody in our, we lived in these amazing do dorms in Urbino, this medieval town. I mean, it was it was quite magical actually thinking back, what, what a beautiful year that was. And, um, all of these, uh, all of my friends, Italian friends, were just fantastic cooks, uh, both young women and young men. You know, they were just amazing. And even making simple things like aglio, olio, peperoncino or something. And then it's just like, wow, you can make this meal and it tastes great. And then some of them had, uh, I don't know, butchered family or something. So they would send like a massive box with like this amazing meats and stuff. So I got really inspired actually. Um, Which and, part of Italy were you in? I was so I was in Le Marche uh, in this little town called Urbino, a medieval town. It was Lovely. quite not too far away from Bologna and Rimini. Um, and then yeah, they just really inspired me. And also uh, there was this connection that I made with produce again, because mm. I, you know, you kind of when you grow up with this kind of stuff. I didn't realize, even when, you know, my food didn't, didn't come out uh, when I tried at university, I didn't make that connection. I didn't understand. I just thought that I was solely a really terrible cook and there was nothing to do with, you know, the, I mean, I was a terrible cook, but, you know, <laughs> another element to it, but I never made this connection. And, um, but in Italy, it kind of, it opened my eyes. I was like, ah, oh my God, this tomato is like in Ukraine, but it's not like the one that I got at a supermarket in England in winter. You know, it's just... It's and funny though, but I think those supermarkets, um, supermarkets near the halls at universities here are not the best they're really because <laughs> they're just really quite basic and tight and they don't <laughs> deal in produce because we do have nice produce here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. So then when, when it all kind of clocked and when, when, I, when I realized what it was, yeah, of course. I mean, you go to a farmer's market now here or even some supermarkets and you can get yeah. fantastic produce. Yeah, it's not that there is no good produce in the UK, not at all. It's just that at that point where I chose to get it or could afford to get it as well, you know, mm. best. Um, so yeah, so then I came back to the UK and I became obsessed. I just started cooking like like a mad woman, and I just yeah. You took a job as a reporter with a, a magazine, and then you just your soul wasn't fulfilled, was it? And you just knew you had to do something with food. Yes, uh, actually, I mean, I I really loved my job. It was for Screen Internationals, and uh, and uh, and it was all about film, and that's another passion of mine. So I did love my job, and then. It was kind of, I think, a quick succession of that whole um, 2008 crisis happening. And then also, I think, swine flu situation was around that time. I don't know. Mm, yeah. So I was like, I felt really over one night. I was just sitting there and I was ill and I was really overworked, I think, because people started getting redundant. And it was just, uh, yeah, it was a really, Pressure. yeah. Yeah. But, but I was in my late 20s, so I didn't really care. You know, it was just like... <laughs> But then, but then there was this low point when I was at home and I just thought, and then this, you know, advert on one of the cooking channels that I was watching for Leith's uh, School of Food and Wine came up and, I just, and there was just like eureka moment like, oh, why am I not doing this? And um, yeah, my best friend later at work said, I don't know why you're not doing this. You're completely obsessed and possessed. You must do it. So then I... Um, yeah, I, I kind of uh, went to my editor and I said, look, I'm thinking of retraining. What do you think? 
uh, will I at some point get redundant? And he was very honest with me. He was like, if that's something that you really want to do, just do it now, just go and do it. And really? I, yeah. And then I was lucky that my parents were able to help me out. Um, yeah, to, to go to Leeds, my poor parents. <laughs> <laughs> Three oh, different age academia, <laughs> they supported you through. They're very yeah. kind. <laughs> but what? listen, I think Leeds is the most amazing place. And it's so many people that we've spoken to over this um, last few weeks have been to Leeds and done their course. And um, quite a few of them have had career changes as well. And I think yeah. if something's knocking at your door, you need to change. You need to make that change. And it's never, ever too late, is it? No, absolutely not. And there were people, at least, that were in their 50s and even 60s, you know. It was a great range of um, ages. And I think what you need to realise if you do want to go into this profession is... I, I didn't have any expectations, quite honestly. I thought, I'll go in. I, want, I don't want to be in an office. I want to do something physically. I love cooking. Yeah, so, boy. That I thought, even if I'm working somewhere in a restaurant and not getting paid very much at all, I know that I'm gonna get up and really love what I'm doing. You know, it's just whoever I meet, I'm like, do you have a really super passionate hobby that you think is a hobby? But actually, maybe it's not a hobby. Maybe you are just it's something turn turn something like that into your profession, and then that's kind of happiness to me. I don't know. Mm. I mean, you also. It's different situations, but I'm very glad that, um, yeah, that I went to Leeds. And to be honest with you, I, in all honesty, I was kind of hoping that I'll just get into a magazine and start doing recipe testing or food styling or something like that. I didn't think that um, I'd go, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to be this super chef or something. You know, that wasn't what was on my mind. But then at Leeds, we had this uh, competition thing where you had to come up with a menu and photograph your food and then you apply to BBC Good Food. And I was selected as one of the six people and then I completely cocked up my interview. So <laughs> I wasn't myself. I was really nervous. It they was... really missed out on you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, but maybe my path would have been gone completely different, you know, so it's, so it's okay. But then yeah. I Ah, my heart sank and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I blew it. I blew everything. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to go and work in a restaurant and see at least for a year or something and see what that's like and just get some experience because I've done some stages during my time at Leeds. And I did. I, I went and I worked in uh, Fulham for a bit in this bistro. And then my head chef was like, you're a little bit obsessed with Otolenghi, aren't you? I'm like, well, yeah, he inspired me to partly to, to change in, uh, my career in a way. And he said, well, they've got an opening. Why don't you apply? And I did. And um, yeah, that was uh, just under a year was with them. And uh, it taught me a lot. It was, uh, it was hard. It was the intense restaurant job. You know, it wasn't all yeah. and talking about Barbaries all day. It was like. <laughs> but you said that you were really, really busy. It really taught you so much. And, yeah. you know, you could do 105 breakfasts up at their busiest store in Islington within three hours, boom, and you could do it with your eyes shut by the end of it. So it really, yeah. really taught you something. And that, that family of Otto Lenghi, like we must have had five people in the last three weeks who have worked or are working, or Sammy Tamimi was talking to us the other night. Okay. And that is such a big family. And they seem to nurture and look after people and teach and share such great skills. Yeah, it was um, it was an amazing experience. I learned so much. Learned about uh, well, stamina. You definitely develop straight away. Uh, a bit of a thick skin um, because definitely I I think I grew up under this kind of um, I don't know what the word is in English. What's the word? A it's rather the... idyllic, beautiful yes. life. Loving environment. <laughs> So, you know, being in a busy kitchen when you just, you know, you, it, it was tough. It was good, but it, it definitely made me feel super strong. And things like, you know, seasoning things properly, uh, mm. loads of, you know, knife skills, because at least it was amazing and we learned so much, but you still need to be in a, you know, in a, to work in a restaurant to really get that kind of with a knife. And speed, I can't, speed, hurry, oh, hurry. Oh, absolutely. And I went in and I saw, you know, these young men, like the chefs, just kind of like talking to me and just looking me in the eye and then doing the really fast chopping. I was like, I want to do that. I want to learn how to do that. And, you know, I did. 
So whenever people say like, oh, shall I go into food? Shall I do this and this? I'm like, yeah, but definitely if you can for, you know, six months or a year, try and do a job, you know, a restaurant job. Yeah. Oh, yes. It will That's really good advice because it's the real world and it's the, the, the sort of um, front line of anything to do with food. Yeah. And then whatever you do after is just a bit of a, not a breeze. I mean, catering, which I did after was still super physical and hard, but, um, but it's a different kind of thing. So once you've been through the restaurant school, you're kind of like, ah, okay. If yeah. I can crazy hours, I can do this. But then you had your son, Sasha, who's now eight. And yeah. you then thought, I can't work in a restaurant anymore. This isn't conducive to my new style of life from being a mother. Yeah. And so you, I love this bit, you cheekily just sent off some details to The Guardian and sort of said, do you want some of my recipes? And they started taking them. And that's how your whole new world evolved, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so by that point, I was working for this company called The Recipe Kit and I was developing recipes for them. So I kind of had some credentials as a recipe writer. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm just sitting around here. Do you want my recipes? But and um, it was a Guardian Cook. Uh, which is now kind of feast, I think. So they were really open to new talent at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, they had this uh, column called Get Togethers and, um, and, and I just kept leafing through it every week. And one week it was, you know, the Moro, uh, you know, uh, the Clark couple or something. And then the next week it was someone who may be, uh, you know, from an ethnic kind of a different ethnic background and their book was coming out or something else, but, you know, largely unknown. And I just thought, oh, oh, I'm just going to give it, give it a go, you know. And I, yeah. I, and I said, look, I'm Ukrainian. I'm a trained chef and I'm also developing recipes. My birthday, my 30, well, 29th birthday or 30th birthday was coming up. And I said, um, uh, my, my ex-partner, my son's son also had a uh, Thai Lao heritage. So I just said, we're going to be cooking this mad, you know, <laughs> Ukrainian Thai food and Lao food. Can you <laughs> Like to come and uh, write about it and they did and that was yeah that was definitely kind of a little bit of a breakthrough and then they had another column called um uh, 10 and uh, something like 10 best of an ingredient and then you could pitch your uh, so they had like a week of aubergine for example and you would just pitch your recipes and the sometimes that pick it so within a year i had about 14 published i think wow so encouraged uh because they kept saying oh, we love your mom's Ukrainian recipes. Like, that's so unusual that, you know, we yeah. don't ma ma many propositions like this. So, yeah, so I kept doing that. And then and then an agent spotted them in The Guardian and she phoned me. And, um, yeah, that's it was quite mad because it was kind of from losing that recipe developing job in February. And then she maybe contacted me in March. And then by April, this whole book situation was happening, which was mad. Which is amazing. She did ask you to to increase your platform, didn't she? So you spent yeah. a couple of months doing that and working hard and off you went and she said, okay, fine, I'll invest, we'll, we'll get this off. And so your first <laughs> book was written just like that. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, April, uh, I got the book deal. And then uh, I remember in May, June, I for two, three months, I went with my son to Ukraine and me and my mom and my auntie, you know, I just kind of like just followed them around and, um, made notes and made them measure things <laughs> because they really are your it's called mamushka because it really is your mother and your aunt's recipes isn't it and it's your childhood recipes of what yeah. you grew up on they're all pretty much all of them are family recipes in that first book yeah and mamushka is because as a joke we used to call my mom mamushka because there's this song in the adams family you know just <laughs> Silly 90s thing uh, film that we watched and then we we're like oh there's a positive reference to eastern europeans for once you know it's not arnold schwarzenegger like if you don't die kind of thing we thought oh there's positivity in there mamushka and then we just kind of started calling my mom mamushka and um and then i casually mentioned it to the publisher in an email i think i was like oh yeah and then my mom and they were like oh what's mamushka i'm like oh it's not even the real word actually i didn't you know it's just in a, in a like a family joke family <laughs> this is your this is your title so yeah and that's brilliant and you won the Fortnum and Mason's um new book yeah writer didn't you that year yeah which sort of just took you to another level yeah the you know uh, yeah I was pinching myself for a while there it was absolutely mad I was uh yeah it was crazy 
It was great. And you were doing supper clubs at Carousel and pop-ups and teaching. Well, yeah, that's the thing. You know, you can you release the book and you've already done loads of hard work, but then you kind of have to keep going and um, and, and to promote it, really. So, you know, a lot of it can be done online and stuff. And that's also hard work, especially if you're kind of at the point uh, single, single mom I was by then with Sash. Uh, yeah. But happily had, you know, my best friend here and my mom would come and give me a hand. And um, But to be honest with you, I mean, it is a lot of uh, travel and hard work, but talking about it was easy. I mean, it's my family. It's quite easy to promote some, or to talk about something like that, you know, to big it up. People say you have a gift because you tell a lovely story. And it's, it's a part of the world that lots of us don't really know. And as you say, it's been mis- um, understood and so you have been given the chance to share the beauty and in the summer what your country can produce yeah because uh, yeah there's always been the stereotype that it's all about potatoes and uh, cabbages, you know which uh, there are amazing cabbage and potato dishes you know but I, I did have a uh, kind of a bit of a complex about that for a while so I thought but um, then, yeah, writing about Mamushka and about the summer produce and also about the southern cuisine, because Ukraine is huge. You know, it's it's uh, it's the biggest, if you don't count Russia, it's the biggest in Europe. And it kind of stretches mm -hmm. from south to north, uh, you know, a few thousand kilometers. So you just, not a few thousand, a thousand or something. So you, you know, you get a great variety of ingredients, of techniques. Uh, obviously, some uh, dishes repeat everywhere, just like in Italy. But then you also have got, you know, your mushrooms and earthy flavors up north and west. And then in the south, you've got these, you know, massive tomatoes and aubergines and whatnot. So, yeah, it's, it was a privilege and um, I feel so lucky to have been able to write about it and to write about it again in this new one as well. Well, yes, because in between that, just quickly, we, you did your other book and um, you won the Observer Rising Star for that yeah. book. Mm, that wasn't for Coca that was also for Mamushka, I think. The oh, was it? Okay. Okay. Put me right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but th that was the food of Georgia and Azerbaijan, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that went down really, really well. But now you're taking us on another journey because I love this. So in your book, um, in Georgia, people have summer kitchens near their vegetable plots, in which are quite simple kitchens. Yeah, so so that's in Ukraine. Yeah, um, so all over Ukraine, even though there's different cuisines and even different peoples in a way, you know, because by the borders you get all sorts of influences from everywhere. Uh, but one thing that they have in common is uh, this um, structure, the summer kitchen, which actually it's not just cooking outside under an awning, even though people do do that. It's actually a separate little house i mean it looks like a miniature version of the main house it's still you know either brick or clay or made out of wood it has a roof it has a porch it has a couple of windows and uh but it's just one room it's just the kitchen um and the way that they kind of came about was uh houses in ukraine uh, traditionally are actually quite low ceilings and they can get mu much cooler but still ukrainian summers can get really really hot you know People don't realize that they think they associate us with Russia and they just think that it's all you know winter and bears it's not it's it becomes it, it very very hot in the south of Ukraine um, so so no air cons inside and also another reason was when a young couple especially in the 1950s after the war once people kind of uh, started living a little a little bit better uh, they would get married and they would get a plot of land at some point. And by that point, they might have had even children or something. And they would build quickly, kind of build this small little uh, structure, like this little house. And they would put a stove there or they would even build a masonry oven if there was a specialist in the village or whatever. And then they would um, uh, make a makeshift bed. And then their life would kind of like mushroom around. So they would build the bigger house throughout the warmer months and they would put their vegetable patch you know i say allotment vegetable patch but it's really some of them are massive fields fields yeah yeah and then, uh and then also you know your orchard if you had one 
and then you would live in this little summer kitchen during that time but then you would move into your bigger house and then just use that in the summer as your separate almost like a kitchen workshop how amazing is that i don't know Beautiful. if uh, i i know i don't want to romanticize it too much because they're also places of graft and it's you know it's uh, the cooking the serious cooking that happens there in summer you know, in my memories, it's like, oh, I was a kid. I was just like running in and out. Maybe sometimes I will do little jobs and like take, uh, you know, cherry stones out or pick like the best uh, vegetables for pickling or whatever. But mums would be there, you know. Stirring, working. Come September, really also preserving. Because, okay. uh, you know, there's no uh, fresh vegetables. You'd get root vegetables, whatever was seasonal. Uh, but then everything else your huge glut would be preserved so there'd be hundreds of jars uh and you'd get them pickled and fermented and whatnot and then it would go down into your cellar and you'd have actually something super healthy throughout winter which you know we weren't even aware how, of how healthy that was to be honest with you because people just did things out of tradition rather than any science or yeah. you know oh this is good for my gut health or something no it was just a practical kind of thing that we used to do um, so yeah, and another thing, funny thing that women kept uh, repeating about the why summer kitchens exist. And then they say, yes, and then, you know, in the summer, you're out of the main house. The kids are out of the main house. You don't have to clean it that often. But <laughs> <laughs> summer kitchen where, you know, you do your thing, then you clear down and that's fine. And the kids are out of the big house. They just kind of like run around outside. In the fresh air. Yeah, if they eat, they eat in this kitchen and that's it. So, I mean, this whole thing about the clean house during the summer was a big thing for them. Like, oh, and then you don't have to clean that one. Oh, uh, you sent me a very sweet little post that I shared on mine um, of a kitchen. And it looked quite 1950s. But yeah. The light was beautiful and you can hear the birds. And it's not far from, I think what you're saying, it wouldn't be a vegetable patch or an allotment. I think it would be a small holding. A small holding. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're creating quite a lot of vegetables. It's quite serious growing, isn't it? It's not yeah. just enough for a week. It's enough for winter. Yeah, yeah. So my mom the other day phoned me and she was like, you know, I'm so sad that you guys might not be coming. I've put in 106 uh, tomato plants, you know, very specific, 106, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so and your parents did this all the way through you growing up, that your, those were your summers? Yeah, the, those were my summers. Uh, when, when when it became kind of warm, uh, it, it was just across the, you know, a few steps away. So we just trotted in, into the summer kitchen. And that's, that's where, you know, all of the pots and pans would kind of move from the main house there. And that's where all the action, you know, life would happen kind of in a way. I would wake up. Uh, my brother's eight years older than me. You know, my mom and dad would be at work, but she would leave kind of like freshly picked strawberries or something. So of course I'm going to romanticize it. You know, that was, that's how I remember them. You know, all of the super nice bits. <laughs> well, I, I think at the moment, some children who are living um, in isolation on farms are most probably enjoying it. Yeah. Because they're allowed to run around the whole of their farm. Um, if they've got a small holding there or a vegetable patch, they're, you know, growing because there's nothing else to do. So they're actually learning so much about yeah. food and how things are produced and how they're grown and it's that lovely journey from the soil to the plate yeah exactly um our thing was quite small in our house so you know the vegetable patch was uh, was quite modest there but my grandma w the summer kitchen that you mentioned before yeah just behind it it's massive it's just they've got everything potatoes tomatoes aubergines bushes of uh i don't know gooseberries and black currants raspberries a quince tree, a walnut tree, everything. It was really quite magical. Um, wow. And because everything's been grown, do you feel that people in the Ukraine, they respect all their produce? And so they, they treat it very beautifully and um, make a special dish to go with the quinces that they've pickled or preserved? Uh, they do, yes. Uh, definitely respect the produce and, you know, some of the rural women, you know, I would come and interview them or whatever, and they were like, we don't spray, you know, this is all organic, you, because organic is kind of like a new word to us. They, people have mm. been doing it organically anyway. It wasn't, you know, a word, but now they, they've learned and they're like, this is organic, you know, I'm like, of course, yeah. 
Oh, well. It's Ukrainian. You, yeah. It's always been Ukrainian. But in terms of summer kitchens and uh, the amount of produce that they have, I'm not sure, because it's so familiar and such a usual thing, I think they were kind of taken aback when I came to interview them about them. They would ask me often, why do you care? Why, why are you interested in this? You know, this is nothing. This is... And mm. so I tried to explain that, you know, wow, you, you've got over there like an excess of uh, 50 kilograms of organic aubergines. I, you know, and I started kind of like mentally calculating how much that would be here, Natura. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot. And, but, but it is a lot. You know, it's, it's justifiably a lot because it's a lot of work. But if grown you, slowly and properly, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Like it's it's absolutely the prices in in the UK are, are you know it's it's not too expensive. This is how much this kind of stuff should cost. Uh, but back at home, people grow it themselves. So, you yeah. know, I'm not sure if um, they they are there. They, all of them understood why I was so fascinated by summer kitchens. To be honest with you, but you know, it's okay. They shared recipes and stories, and that was lovely. It's and tell us about the cover of your book, because there's something about a summer kitchen that was built around oh, a roof at yeah. your grandparents. Wonderful yes. um, design uh, by a Ukrainian designer, a designer, Anastasia Stefurak. So basically, uh, in the late 1950s, I think, or even early 60s, my grandma and grandpa, so my mom's parents, moved into a new house and uh and that one didn't actually have a summer kitchen uh and they went uh-huh that's interesting okay we must build a summer kitchen i mean that's you know it, it must we must have one and he and my granddad decided to kind of build it almost as an annex uh to the main house and where it kind of made sense to put it there was this massive uh yellow cherry tree and but he loved it too much my mom said he was just like he loved it and um even though there was this massive, really thick, established kind of big branch in the way, he apparently didn't want to cut it off. So he incorporated it into the structure of the kitchen because it's used in the summer. So, you know, it didn't matter if in the winter it would be blowing in or whatever, but he kind of put it through the wall and out of the roof. And when she told me the story, it was just like, what, really? <laughs> crazy you know and and did I ever think that my granddad was a particularly eccentric person no maybe he was you know he was so quiet he was quite kind of like super subdued and would just occasionally like come up with a little joke you know and then he would just be back into himself but um yeah I mean I guess maybe Ukrainians in general are a little bit eccentric like that because when we traveled all over you would see kind of interesting idiosyncrasies like that in people in people's families and like weird and quirky things that they do and it's just it's quite heartwarming yeah it's lovely he must have had a massive respect for nature the way he wanted to build around it and keep it and oh, it was part of the house absolutely and my and my grandmother as well i mean she sang to her flowers i mean she was if, apart from growing all of the produce she also had masses of flowers everywhere she loved them and she firmly believed and i think scientifically it's been proven that if you talk that plants can perceive all of these you know sonic like voice and i i am not a scientist i can explain it properly but apparently i think she was right she said that if you sing to flowers they grow better and she did and it's yeah again it's, it's such an i do know lots of people who sing to their flowers but i think it's therapy <laughs> for them sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you about the recipes? Because obviously you're going to have lots of produce and vegetables and fruits, but have we got meats and fish and um, various things like that? What are we going to be treated to? Yes, absolutely. Um, loads of delicious meat and fish uh, dishes. And um, one of my favorites is actually this pork that my mom made. I think she used a uh, knuckle one in winter and I, I you know I came from the UK to Ukraine and they already kind of finished this knuckle <laughs> and there was a little bit of meat left and all of this like quite a nice fatty piece of pork has been roasted uh, and underneath there was some homemade kraut uh, some prunes like really plump prunes apricots caraway coriander seed all of these apples all of these delicious things and all of the pork juice is kind of sunk into it and she had a some of this cabbage left and a bit of pork left 
And she um, also made this dough to make these sweet buns called perishki, were usually filled with uh, poppy seed paste or something. And she used this dough and just filled, just stuffed it with this meat, left over like cabbages with a tiny bit of meat in. And oh my word, that was probably one of the best things that, so they're not necessarily a traditional recipe, but she yeah. just, but a lot of food happens like that, doesn't it? So she made it quite, quite a traditional Ukrainian, almost like a biggest kind of, biggest kind of um, dish. And then she just stopped these buns. So that's amazing. Then there's another one with, um, so what we do in Ukraine, or they used to do quite a lot is ferment whole cabbage leaves. So not just kraut, but the outer tougher leaves that we normally throw away, they would uh, layer the kraut in between the layers or, or, or they would put it on the, at the bottom. So they would also ferment and pickle and become softer. And that's how my grandma used to make uh, holupti, which are cabbage rolls. So you fermented uh, sour leaf and you would fill it again in the book. It's got some barley and a little bit of uh, slow cooked pork, but you can use goat as well, which would be delicious. And you roll them up and cook them in this really uh, beautiful kind of a little bit of stock and a bit of creme fraiche and loads of garlic. So it's like soft, mellow garlic. And then you cook them in the oven so they get a little bit blistered on the outside. Oh, it's just so good. It's really delicious. It's really good. But the vegetable uh, chapter is massive. It's, I think it's the yeah. biggest book. Uh, because really, I mean, back in the day, people would not eat meat every day, especially if you're rearing your own animals, you're not going to kill a chicken every bloody day, you know, you're going to have some. <laughs> so even if it was, it maybe it wasn't fully vegetarian food, they would use fat, like animal fat to fry the onions with or whatever. But, um, but big chunks of meat, you definitely, you know, it wouldn't be a thing. And in Ukraine, was it normal to have big chunks of meat or was it often delicately cooked and then flaked and mixed with something to sort of make it go a bit further because of the economics of a big chunk of meat? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that we make is borscht, of course, and that's where you put your... Uh, quite, we've, we've got quite fatty brisket uh, in Ukraine. So either kind of beef brisket or a whole chicken you'd put in a pot, you know, you don't even <laughs> take it apart, you just go plump yeah. like, with the feet and with everything and with the big <laughs> So a really good stock is made. Yeah, yes. Or like these really long um, oxtail, again, it wasn't <laughs> pulled apart. So to me, when I came to the UK and I saw the big kind of thick pieces of oxtail in the shop, I was like, oh, that looks weird. I'm used to the really long <laughs> altogether. <laughs> What the, you curl round to put in a pot? Yeah, it's mad. Um, so, or you'd use that to make a borscht. And of course, um, at, at least, you know, borscht are different everywhere and it's an amazing dish. But where I'm from, it was really thick. It was, you know, my grandma used to say, oh, you need to put a spoon in it and it doesn't move, you know, that kind of thing. Like, so loads of vegetables and loads of this kind of meat that kind of like falls apart almost. And yes, you, you make things last for, for a long time. Um, and you don't waste stuff. I mean, uh, you know. And can I ask you about your famous fermented tomatoes? <laughs> uh, I'd love to claim them as my own, but yeah, they're definitely everyone in Eastern Europe, I think, makes them. Um, they are just amazing, and they're very easy to make. You just, uh, just get really nice tomatoes, basically, when they're in season and when they're sweet. And actually, in the UK, I think the you know the really small cherry i i yeah. love tomatoes work really really well you just put them into a jar and then you make a brine uh kind of about 20 grams of salt to a liter of water or something like that um and then you put your flavorings in as well so a little bit of bashed garlic some allspice uh maybe a few uh bay leaves or something and then you just pour this water you dissolve the salt pour the water in, in over the tomatoes in the jar you you close the lid and you just leave them somewhere warm. I mean, it's so hot right now. I think within two, three days, you'll see the bubbles forming and it will go cloudy, which is good, which means the yeasts and bacteria are all working and stuff. And then w after about a week in this heat, they soften a little bit and they're almost like you touch them and you think, oh my God, this stuff is going to explode in my <laughs> So you pop them in your mouth um, and they just go poof. And it's this fizzy, delicious, my mom calls them champagne tomatoes. 
Uh, such a delicious thing. I really, I highly recommend you give them a go because they're also really easy to make. If you, just a quick kind of tip, if you see a little bit of white, kind of what looks like mold uh, forming, it's not mold, it's called cam's yeast. Uh, now I know the scientific term. Uh, and it's absolutely benign. Uh, it's fine. You don't have to worry about it. Just smell it and taste it. And if it all smells pleasant, you're, you're good. People get so worried about for, about fermentation, but really, it's it's easy. It's easy stuff. It's fine if if the mold's black, you're in trouble. But any other <laughs> color, and it's fine almost. And, and it's uh, slimy, and it, yeah, it doesn't look good. Game over. But <laughs> <laughs> and I see you make kombucha. And what do you flavor your kombucha with? Uh, oh yeah, so we've got a couple on the go now, and this is a bit of an experiment because I'm trying to do this whole uh, zero waste situation, and I think we. We did get a pineapple uh, recently, and the skins, I'm going to put them in. Oh, so we lovely. Secondary fermentation situation, but I'm going to put the skins in. But a bit of ginger and lemon works really well, and also berries when they're in season. I mean, even if you don't waste your raspberries, strawberries maybe, but <laughs> once, um, I really want to try a black, black currant one. I think that's going to be so good, the woody flavors and stuff. That will be lovely. And how much do the Ukrainians and all of Eastern Europe love you? Because you've put their food on the map. Are you extremely popular over there? I think I'm popular uh, with Ukrainians here and maybe the US. Uh, and definitely in Poland, uh, both Mamushka and Caucasus have been doing really well, I think. And when I went there, I think that was the first time when I felt like, oh, people know me, you know, people would come up to me and, uh, you know, ask for an autograph and be like, oh. <laughs> 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 uh, but in Ukraine, I, I think I'm largely unknown. So, um, yeah. Is that because they just don't have media, maybe? No, no, they have media. Uh, when, I don't know, they, they just, the publishers never quite, it's not published in Ukrainian. That's incredible. Because you're sort of like marketing for them and opening up their country to the world because you have done tours out there, haven't you? Food tours. Uh, yes, yes, I have. Uh, yeah, and I always kind of uh, yeah, go on about Ukraine and how wonderful it is for sure. But um, to be honest with you, I think it's economical. I don't know how, if this book here costs 25 quid, I just don't know if people mm. in Ukraine are able to afford it basically. So I don't know if it's, if it's that or I, I'm not sure yeah. if it happened, but okay. yeah. And will you be doing any more food tours or not for the foreseeable future, obviously? I, it makes my heart sink. Uh, yeah, we were supposed to do one. Actually, we, we normally go to Western Ukraine and we were going to do a um, Southern Ukraine. I was going to take people pretty much home <laughs> to my to my hometown. Uh, but it got cancelled. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to yeah. see. Our fingers but you are doing them. And when life returns to normal, you'll be doing them again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's with the um, experience Ukraine and beyond online. And um, yeah, it's uh, they're, they're really fun. We do loads of cooking and hiking up the mountains to see shepherds and their goats and things. It's, it's super fun. Oh, I think it would be amazing. Someone's just asked if you would um, want to open a restaurant. Uh, rest <laughs> in a normal world, you can't answer that now, but has it, has it played around in your mind? four months old baby and this situation. But even before that, I've been asked that before. And to be honest with you, I'm a, quite a creative person and you know, I can cook and I can do, uh, you know, all of the kind of thinking about menus and even cooking and even that I'm cooking in a restaurant. I love it. It's such a buzz, but all of the business side, if somebody that, you know, with loads of money came, came in and said, hello, I'm a very nice person. I'm not just a, a big cat, but I will give you this money and uh, we shall open. <laughs> You're whatever. hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's do it. And I will take care of the business side and all of the leaking pipes and stuff. And you just cook and create. Yes, sure. But I don't think that's going to happen, is it? So I'm, yeah, I'm just going to, if, when life returns to normal, I'm going to start doing pop-ups. And actually, um, I'm doing a little co collaboration with a restaurant in East London called The Laughing Heart. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, they're going to be making uh, almost like a, not a recipe kit. I mean, it's going to be almost ready kind of food, which you come and pick up as a takeaway. And then you come home and, and cook at home. So, okay, the so it's like a ready box of all the ingredients yeah. and the recipe. 
Yeah, and there's going to be Monty dumplings for Mamushka to begin with, and then there's going to be some exciting things. Maybe those cabbage rolls that I described before with the fermented leaves uh, once the book comes out as well. So, yeah, it's a nice opportunity for people to try the food as well. And that's with the laughing heart, you said? The, yeah, the laughing heart in Hackney. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's great to know. Everyone, if you want a taste of the book, that's where you go. Yeah. And someone's just asked, and I ask you this anyhow, I'll ask that in a moment. Um, so what's your favorite cooking tool? Uh, ooh, well, small. <laughs> if you have a favorite knife or a favorite peeler. Yeah, yeah, I think an, an, a good knife is, you know, it's pretty much all you need, I think. I, I do love my really massive, heavy kind of pestle and water as well for some things. And uh, I do have my grandma's uh, rolling pin. Oh, that's beautiful. Is it wood? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a really nice one. Uh, my mom keeps saying, you know, thousands of Pelmeni and Vareniki have been made using this pin. And it's always, it's a nice thought to kind of just like, ah, you're, you're having another run, old girl, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's good. That's fantastic. And um, can you share your favorite food related film, book, hero, chef, restaurant? Oh, I did actually start thinking about these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got disturbed, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. uh, right. No, I, I did. You only need to answer one. You don't need to answer all of those. Okay, I will definitely have a couple of books. Um, so Squirrel Pie by Elizabeth Lord. If you haven't read that, I think such a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, there's some really gorgeous uh, bits of travel around Eastern Europe as well. And just the way uh, Elizabeth writes is, um, yeah, I want to be like She's a her. beautiful writer. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, oh, I had another one. And uh, oh, actually, from kind of literature, if you read, um, if you pick up Nikolai Gogol, it some of his stories, um, novellas do have some wonderful descriptions of Ukrainian food. Okay. Um, so that's a really good one. Uh, then, uh, was it Chef? Well, it's either a chef or a TV program or a podcast or a restaurant. Oh, yes. Uh, the... Or a film. You don't need to answer all of them. Uh, We're not going to put you through too much. You're busy. <laughs> uh, so podcasts, uh, one of the uh, food podcasts that I listen to a lot is um, a Splendid Table uh, which is an American podcast, and it's wonderful. Um, and then also, actually, Alisa Timoshkina uh, has just started Mother Food, uh, which is great. So it's all about, uh, you know, be a strong woman, being a mom, cooking. And, uh, yeah, she ha she's had some really great people like Amiko Davis. Um, and, and, and there's another one by Sumaya Usmani, uh, who is doing a podcast on um, sensory cooking. Uh, so yeah, that's another one that uh, people might want to uh, tune in to. They're all, yeah, relaxing, I think, as well. Such Both of them have such kind of like chill voices. I really love it. Lovely. <laughs> that sounds great. Oh, this is absolutely fantastic. We've loved you taking time out from your young family and your older family. Um, we wish you all the very, very best of luck with Summer Kitchen. Tell us when it comes out again. So it's coming out on the 25th of June, but you can already pre-order and that please even, I think if your local bookshop uh, might be able to do that for you, it just really helps uh, book. I don't know how it works, but I keep being told, get the pre-orders. It really helps to get the book off the ground. So if you're able to, or if you're thinking to get the book, um, yeah, that would be super awesome if you could. Otherwise, yeah, it's out on the 25th of June. Well, I think it's going to be a book that takes us all on a simple and beautiful, tasteful holiday. And we're going to learn about somewhere that we've not been before. So it's worth it in this pandemic. Yeah. And it'll last you forevermore. And I'm sure pick up loads of tips. Thank you so much, Fran, for having me. Thank you. Pleasure. It's really nice to meet you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Bye.